All right, in this very short video, we're gonna deal with two things. We're gonna talk about the relationship between the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform, and why in your circuit courses, I mean, I don't know if they do it, but it's common in engineering, they say, let's do the Laplace transform and move to the frequency domain, from the time domain, which is not quite true, huh? but we will understand what is it, why they say it, what it means, and what it really is. So we're gonna understand that, and also we're gonna relate a little bit some notions of uh, algebra and calculus again to see that there are two different sides of the same coin. All right, first, the Laplace transform, I have it written here, and the Fourier transform that I have it written here will multiply by root 2 pi. The normalization factor is irrelevant for this analysis. And let's compare the two. Now, we see that uh, there are two differences. The first difference is that this starts at zero, at time equals zero. That ignores completely what happens for the negative time domain and this one integrates over the whole time domain. And the other difference is that there's an ik instead of a minus s in here. All right, so first of all, if we restrict the Fourier transform to causal functions, remember what causal functions are? Functions that are exactly zero for negative t, so there's zero and they start, so if it's a signal, it's a signal that doesn't exist until some point equals zero when it starts existing, okay? They start at time equals zero. For causal functions, it's true that the Fourier transform becomes an integral from zero to t. Still, it's not the same thing. It is still not the same as the Laplace transform. And we know that the Fourier transform is the real deal that takes me from the, the space of times, the representation of times, to the space of frequencies. In time domain, to a frequency domain, the transformation is the Fourier transform. It's literally, remember where it comes from. It comes from expressing in the, in, the, in the Fourier series. We express the function in terms of the different frequency components it has, and then we do the limiting the continuum when we have a very, very long function with an infinite period. So it is truly the Fourier transform that captures the frequency domain, not the Laplace transform. They're lying to you when they tell you, we move to the frequency domain doing Laplace. Then why do they tell it? Well, the other thing to realize is that if we make the change of uh, k going to is, that change here, so the Laplace transform, to get the Laplace transform, you need two things first causal functions, and then for those causal functions, the, the Laplace transform doesn't take you to the frequency domain, it takes you to the imaginary frequency domain. <laughs> so it's, the, La, the Laplace transform is like a Fourier transform for causal functions, but taking it to the imaginary frequency domain. What is the meaning of that imaginary frequency? It's got a meaning. And the meaning is not uh, found in circuits or anywhere, the meaning in physics it's related to something called big rotations. It's the same as imaginary time, in a way. Imaginary time is a thing in physics. It's so funny, it's so cool, because it relates dynamics, time evolution, with equilibrium thermodynamics, with thermal states. I'm not gonna talk much more about that, but if you're interested in that kind of physics, we can talk about it a little bit. That thing uh, you won't learn until, if you do physics, you won't learn until maybe the last year, or perhaps grad school, depending on what courses you take or what professors you have. But this is cool because it's that relationship between, okay, what if I take the time imaginary or frequency imaginary? I can do more calculation. Does it have a physical interpretation? And it does. Now, the one thing I want you to get in your minds is that it's not the Laplace transform that takes you from time domain to frequency domain. That's the Fourier transform. We saw that. But the Laplace transform takes causal functions to the imaginary frequency domain. <laughs> All right? So in that sense, they're similar. You can tell why they're similar. Now, Let's look more into the Laplace transform and a relationship with linear algebra. I'm hoping by, that by this point, you know about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If you don't, you can still watch this, but then rewatch it again when you see that on algebra, right? Okay, then uh, well, let's do it. All right, this is a sentence from your algebra course, right? V is an eigenvector of the matrix M with eigenvalue lambda, if when I act with the matrix M on the vector, I recover the same vector multiplied by lambda. Now, this is kind of cool. These vectors are important. The, the matrix kind of scales the vectors when it acts on them. It does nothing. It doesn't mess with the components. It's multiplied by a number. And those eigenvectors are very important because when you diagonalize the matrix, what you're doing is expressing the matrix in the basis of its eigenvectors. 
And when the matrix is diagonal, it's simple to do things. And we do it all the time. Remember how you diagonalize? You find the characteristic polynomial. The same name as when we solve um, uh, ODEs, right? Well, there's a reason for that, because of course it's related. <laughs> anyway, we'll see a little bit of that. Now, uh, that's the notion of eigenvalue and eigenvector. An eigenvector of M is a vector that the matrix has by multiplication, and they are important because if I express uh, my vectors, my vector space, in terms of a basis of eigenvectors of M, operating with M is very easy. I don't have to do matrix multiplication. It's just regular multiplication, you see? That maps from doing matrix multiplication to regular multiplication by a scalar. It makes the problem simpler. Now, here's something to reflect about. Consider the space of second order polynomials. That's a generic second order polynomial. It's a space of dimension three. How do I know? Well, because I can collect the components in a three dimensional vector, right? So R3. Right. Let's see what's the effect of this matrix. What does this matrix do? 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. What does it do? Well, let's do the matrix multiplication. Now, the first component is 0, the second component is 2a, the third component is b. Ha! Huh. If I remap this into a polynomial, I get 0x squared plus 2ax plus b. Oh my god! What is the relationship between these two? <laughs> if this is p of x, the thing is the derivative of p of x. So if this is p of x, this matrix is the freaking derivative. This matrix is the freaking derivative for all second order polynomials. All of them. If I put any second order polynomial, this matrix will return the derivative. <laughs> How is that? The derivative is a linear operator, so maybe it's a matrix in a way of manner of speaking. In fact, you can do it for any order polynomial. If it's third order, right, it's a four dimensional space, you would have this one, a three, zero, 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 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. This one takes the derivative of any fourth order polynomial, or third order polynomial. And you can actually keep going and do n, n minus 1, and you can have an infinite dimensional matrix for an infinite order polynomial, infinite degree polynomial. And that is all analytical functions, remember? All the functions that have Taylor expansions are nothing but polynomials. So yeah, the derivative is a matrix, <laughs> infinite dimensional perhaps, but it's a matrix, analytic functions. Isn't that cool? It gets even cooler. What are, so if a matrix, if operating with a matrix becomes simpler when you express everything in the basis of eigenvectors of the matrix, what are the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of the derivative? Huh. So. DDX is the matrix, M if you want. Then F of X is the vector, B. I want this to be lambda times the vector. Right? That's the analogous. Now, do you know of any functions that the derivative acts on them by multiplication? You do. And usually at this point, several students tell me, the exponential! Oh my freaking goodness! Look at that, the exponential of lambda x. When I take the derivative, is equal to the lambda, the exponential of lambda x. Certainly, this equation, there you go. So the exponentials are the eigenvectors, we call them eigenfunctions. You see, but it's the same as an eigenvector. They are the eigenvectors of the derivative as a linear operator. So if we could express all the functions in the basis of exponentials, then the acting with derivatives and solving differential equations will be super easy because derivatives act by multiplication. Right. When we do the Laplace transform, we're expressing a function as a linear combination of the inner product of the exponentials with the functions. So certainly this is the projection of this vector on this vector. This is an inner product, remember? So this is the projection of this function on this vector, so this is the component, this, this thing that I'm writing here, sorry, and this is capital, I get, I get emotional, capital F of S. Capital F of S is the projection of the function F of T on the exponential e to the minus ST. So this is literally, literally, 
the expression, the components of the function f of t in the basis of exponentials. That's what we have. So we have diagonalized the space of function, the, 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 the derivative, and expressed all the functions in terms of its eigenvectors, the exponentials. That is why Laplace transforms solve differential equations. Remember what happened when we Laplace transform? We get rid of the derivatives, and then instead we get multiplication by s. Remember, when this a derivative, is an s. When it's second derivative, s squared. Remember that? <laughs> so literally, it's the same as this. Here, by expressing everything in terms of the eigenvectors of a matrix, we get rid of the matrix multiplication and we just regular multiplication. By expressing all functions in terms of the basis of exponentials, which are the eigenbasis of the derivative, we remove the need to de take derivatives, which is the matrix product. We don't need to take derivatives anymore. We do multiplications. That's why the Laplace transform is so effective at solving differential equations, because it makes you work in the eigenspace, in the space of eigenfunctions of the derivative, which are the exponentials. Now, I hope that this reveals a little bit how algebra and calculus are just two different sides of the same freaking coin. And those of you who are inclined to study this, which is kind of cool and can inspire you for this kind of thinking is always inspiring and helps you come up with ideas in everything. I recommend that you look into something called functional analysis. First, the root would be take real analysis, complex analysis, functional analysis. And if you're even more interested, uh, differential geometry. All right. Anyway, this is just a recommendation, and if not, take it as a cool note. I hope that by the time you watch this, you've seen diagonalization in algebra. If not, please revise this video when you see diagonalization in algebra. All right, and with this, I'm going to finish talking about the Fourier transform, and we're going to move now to partial differential equations. I hope that you enjoy this blog because it's kind of nice. We haven't seen a lot about Fourier transform, but we've seen enough to see the power of it, hopefully, and how interesting it is, and how it's behind so much interest in physics, engineering, and many math cool things. Anyway, I'll see you for the partial differential equations. Until then, bye-bye.